Well, hello friends. Welcome back to Code Review. Today, we are going to look at this pull request, add a new spec compliant URL parser by Max. And uh, before we get into it, though, let me just give you some context on what the URL uh, class in Serenity is. So in the ACK um, framework, we have a, an URL class or a URL class, if you will. And it represents a URL. Uh, but this thing was not written with the um, URL standard on hand. It was sort of written ad hoc, if you will. And um, just based on parsing whatever URLs we had to throw at it at the time, we grew it to something resembling a, a um, URL parser, but probably pretty far from the spec. So currently, uh, parsing happens in the parse helper here. So URL parse takes a string view, and then it has an internal state machine um, used to peek and consume its way through the, um, the URL string and, I guess, compute some kind of uh, state. And the URL object currently has um, a bunch of these things that it, it computes from the input. So uh, protocol, host, path, query, fragment, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, so this will be interesting because um, it's certainly a like a, a super important component of any contemporary system is understanding URLs, right? So because I mean they're everywhere, so we it's it's a very good thing to to make this conformant, I think. So let's read what Max writes here. This pull request completely reworks the ACK URL class to support a new URL parser. The new parser should follow the URL specification. Cool. It makes the following changes. Rename a protocol to scheme. Okay. Uh, implement a new percent encode and decode mechanism. Add some new member variables. Sure. Implement a new parser. Add some new methods and helpers. Add new serialization methods. Rewrite compute validity to conform to the new parser. Sure. And then add and rewrite tests for the URL class. The most significant changes to ACK URL are the path is now stored in a vector of string rather than just a string. Sure. To get the entire path as a string, you can call string path. It remains in place. Sure. Um, the members now store percent decoded data. So, okay. So I guess previously we had uh, percent encoded data uh, in our member, member variables. Fine. Uh, and then the following bugs required immediate fixing. In libhttp, we have to take into account that path is no longer encoded when creating and parsing raw requests. Okay. And some bugs regarding launch server, which were caused by creating file URLs by hand. They now use URL create with file scheme instead. Okay, so I guess uh, by uh, making URL spec compliant, uh, it tripped up some code in the system that was relying on, uh, you know, less compliant behavior. Makes sense. And then various methods implemented in other ACK classes like uh, UTF-8 code point iterator peak and trim functions with custom set of characters to trim for string, string view, and string utils. Sure. Thoughts on changing to percent decoded data in member variables. When I use the URL class and I call URL path or URL query, for example, I expect to get the path of the resource requested and expect the URL class to abstract away URL encoding. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I agree with that. Um, as a user of the URL class, you don't care about um, like URL encoding, right? You just want whatever um, whatever data is encoded. So, okay, note, as this is quite a large change to a widely used API, don't refrain from suggesting how it could be improved or what I should maybe do differently. I'm happy to discuss. 
See, that's a very, a very nice attitude. Um, okay. Note two, there are quite a few performance gains available in the parser. I am sure about that. I just tried to implement it as close to the spec as possible. I love that. That's, that's exactly um, how you should approach this sort of thing. First, you build the thing correctly, and then you think about performance. So of course, there are going to be performance gains available in a first cut of any parser. Um, the most often used paths should be some, somewhat performant. Uh, implementing those state machine based parsers uh, is always a trade off between staying true to the spec, which makes maintaining and fixing bugs easier and performance, of course. Well, yes. Um, did I already put one of those things? Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> let's not, let's not remove the, uh, the hooray emoji. Uh, and then there has been a little bit of iteration and then we have just a, a huge stack of commits. So this looks very, very cool. Let's uh, dig into it. Okay. So the first commit just renames all references to, uh, to protocol to scheme, which is the name used by the Earl standard. Externally, all methods referencing protocol were duplicated with scheme. The old methods still exist as compatibility. Um, I mean, that's okay. I think uh, we should definitely just change to scheme everywhere if that is the um, sort of the official terminology of, of the Earl standard. Uh, so, I think uh, it's fine to do that in stages, but um, yeah, that, that's fine to do that in stages. We don't need to, because otherwise this um, this change here would be just all over the place, right? So it's nice to do a targeted, targeted change like that at first. Okay, and then the next patch is implement UTF-8 code point iterator peak. This adds a peak method to UTF-8 code point iterator which enables it to be used in some parsing cases where pe peaking is necessary. Peak zero is equivalent to operator star, except that peak does not contain any assertions and will just return an empty optional. This also implements a test case for iterating UTF-8. Okay, and then what does this do? Um, if uh, okay, so if you're peaking without an offset, so I guess this um, a UTF-8 uh, code point iterator is just a helper that you get from our uh, UTF-8 view class, for example. So if you have UTF-8 view onto a um, string buffer uh, and you call begin on it, then it gives you a UTF-8 uh, UTF code point iterator. Uh, and it allows you to iterate individual Unicode code points conveniently uh, by abstracting away the decoding. So basically what this is, is just a way to look. Currently, the iterator only looks at the current uh, character, the current code point, but this gives you a way to look ahead. So um, that makes sense to have something like that. And uh, it does that by just making a copy of the uh, self iterator and advancing that. So yeah, seems reasonable. And of course, if we hit the end before we've taken all the steps we wanted, then we return an empty optional. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yes. This seems very reasonable. So moving ahead. So next commit adds a trim method to string, string view, and string utils. Um, okay, so it's a complement to trim white space. So we already have trim white space, but uh, trim white space hard codes which characters get trimmed. So trimming is like removing all of the uh, white space from the um, left or right side of a string, or both sides. That's the trim mode, actually, left, right, and both. Um, and it 
Uh, it returns a string view. Oh, that's so nice, actually. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, like, I, I hope this doesn't return a string because a <laughs> trimmed string is just a substring, so it could totally be a string view. Um, so I guess now it's just being made a bit more flexible in that you can provide your own um, characters that get trimmed. So cool, very cool. And then trim white space becomes a wrapper around the new trim. Sure, makes sense. Quite tasteful, okay. Um, I don't necessarily love that we are hard coding this uh, string here that has all the different white space characters, but at the same time, it's not a huge deal. And uh, ah, whatever, that's fine. Okay, so implement more conforming URL percent encode slash decode mechanism. Right, this adds a few new functions to percent encode and decode strings according to the URL specification. The functions allow specifying a percent encode set, which is defined by the specification. It will be used to replace the current URL encode and URL decode functions in a further commit. Uh, this commit adds a few duplicate helper functions in the URL class, such as isDigit and isASCIIDigit. This will be cleaned up as soon as the upcoming new URL parser will replace the current one. All right. Yeah, so we're adding stuff like isASCII alpha, isASCII digit, stuff like that. So these kind of things, they are uh, duplicated in a bunch of places throughout the code base. It, it could be cool to it definitely feels like we should find a common location for helpers like this because they're just um, like they just tend to be used in, in so many places. But um, as he mentions here in the commit message, they will be cleaned up uh, eventually. So let's just uh, let's just live with those at the moment. And then what are we looking at here? Percent encode code point. So. Um, so here's probably an example that just <laughs> that stands out of uh, future optimization opportunities. So um, the fact that we are returning a string here means that we heap allocate uh, for every code point that we encode. That is definitely something avoidable, um, but uh, it's also okay at the moment. So. Um, I don't expect this thing to have great performance on the first cut. It's just, uh, uh, it's just something. So I'm going to make a note of that here. So, uh, this, uh, definitely looks like something, uh, where we can improve performance, uh, down the road by avoiding, um, string construction, constructing, uh, creating. String objects. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So then it's just um, depending on the code point that we're encoding, we need to do the format a little bit differently. Sure. Um, let's see. Percent. Percent encoded bytes, wait. A percent encoded byte is um, the percent character followed by two ASCII hex digits. Sequences of percent encoded bytes, percent decoded, should not cause UTF-8 decode without bomb to fail or return failure. Um, two percent encoded byte return a string consisting of percent character followed by two ASCII upper hex digits representing byte. Right. So that's what um, oh, um, what was going on here, right? So um, in this case, if the code point is in the ASCII character set, then we only need a single byte. But then uh, for code points that don't fit it, fit within a single byte, we have to do multiple bytes. So that's just what this code is doing here. Um, 
right now I can tell that there is a coding style error here, um, missing some spaces in between. So um, I wonder if this is a flaw in our continuous integration um, testing setup because you're you normally you get uh, told if you are screwing up coding style, but I guess if you mess up coding style in one commit and then patch it in a subsequent commit, um, it ends up not telling you. But um, I'm just going to uh, mention that here anyway, since this is uh, this is not not conformant. Okay, and then we have bool code point is in percent and code sets. So that's the percent and code set that he mentioned. Um, Cause the spec uh, defines a bunch of uh, percent and code sets. And what are those? What is a percent and code set? Is that um, an enum? Yes, it's an enum class. Okay, fine. So let's see if we can look at that. So to determine whether the code point, a given code point is within a given percent of code set, um, we have this helper and then it just uh, branches on the set. So I guess the sets are listed here somewhere. Um, set. Okay, so here are some of them, right? Um, C0 control percent code set are the C0 controls and all code points greater than. Right, so um, uh, I see. Okay, so it's kind of funny. It's it's written in this um, recursive way that uh, because these some of these sets include other sets, uh, like this set is this other set plus this other set. So then he just recurses here, uh, but it's const expert and it's probably fine. Um, it's kind of a kind of a cute way to express this, actually. I, I like it. Okay, so I'm just going to um, assume that these are okay. Right, and then percent encode takes a code point and a percent encode set. Sure. So a single code point. So like, here's more of these, um, uh, like w generating a string per code point. It's quite, quite something. But okay. So what we're doing here is we're checking, does this code point need to be percent encoded? If not, we just uh, return it as a string after appending it to a string builder. Yeah, so it kind of convoluted. Um, but we don't, also, we don't have a way to express this. Um, when it comes to string builder, um, the argument of the string builder constructor is um, the initial capacity. And I think so he was passing four, but um, M buffer is a byte buffer. So we already have 128 bytes of inline capacity, um, which means that that capacity is part of the object uh, and does not require any heap allocation. It's right here in the union um, inline buffer. And I think because of that, like providing um, an initial capacity that's less than the default uh, inline capacity of string builder is um, like pointless. It, it's, a, it's a pointless micro optimization. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's not I mean, this this function here is so obviously unoptimized anyway that I think reaching for this arbitrary micro optimization is um, it's like the it's it's not the right move. So um, 
as a default inline capacity of 128 bytes. Uh, so specifying less than that, um, not achieve anything as far as I can tell. Um, given that this function is so obviously unoptimized, unoptimized anyway, uh, let's not uh, reach for random micro optimizations like this. Is unoptimized not a word according to the dictionary? Well, it is now. Just adding <laughs> things to the dictionary. Okay. Um, and then what do we have here? Percent and code, sure. So now we're taking a whole string and the way we build a whole string is that we call percent and code for each code point. Um, right, so uh, this, this is definitely an area where we can improve. Uh, what we would wanna do here instead is perhaps uh, constructing a string builder here in the outer loop that, that works on the whole string uh, and passing the string builder to the inner function. So the, the function that does a percent encode of an individual code point would receive a mutable reference to the, um, to the string builder. And then it will be able to keep adding to the same string builder instead of having to construct a new string, which is a heap allocation every time. Um, Uh, um, I know we're not optimizing yet, but um, I would suggest writing, um, passing the string builder as a mutable reference to the per code point um, to the, the percent so we can so we can avoid uh, creating all the temporary string objects eh, that's 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 that just seems like a better API in general because um, Yeah, it's it's interesting to find the line between uh, premature optimization and um, just decent architecture, um, because yes, it's good to avoid obsessing about performance when you're just building something out, but if there are uh, kind of typical patterns in your code base that um, that are, are you know prevalent and um, tend to tend to give um, good benefits, such as passing in a string builder while you're building something. That's something that we do in many places. Uh, I think it still makes sense to apply patterns like that uh, while you're building something new. Um, but um, I think this is Max has not been working on the code base for that long, so um, I certainly. Certainly don't expect everybody to know all of the random patterns that we have been evolving. And this is actually, so far this, this PR is really strong for a new um, Serenity developer. It's like extremely tidy and professional looking. Uh, so let's see what else we got. Parse hex digit. Uh, like, oh, this kind of stuff. Uh, Nothing against this code, it's just that <laughs> we have so many copies of this. Um, I feel like we're, um, we have um, multiple copies of this logic already in various places in the code base. Uh, it would be really nice to find a common location for all of them somewhere in ACK. 
code base. Is code base, okay, sidebar or sidetrack, let's see, code base or code space base. I feel like it's one word, right? Code base, yeah, code base. Come on, dictionary. I'm a little bit disappointed in how many um, software engineering related terms are not in the default dictionary that I get on Linux. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a, a software engineering add-on or something I can get, but I find myself constantly like going add to dictionary on basic programming terms. Um, I guess over time, my local dictionary will improve. It just seems like like, isn't this supposed to be kind of a um, power user OS? <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, that's definitely something um, when we eventually get into spell checking, which we probably should sooner or later, um, it's definitely something that I want to make sure that we have like all of the programming terms are in there because that's what I write about most of the time. <laughs> okay, so percent decode. If input does not contain a percent, we just return the input. Makes sense, okay? So we just uh, we just like scan through the whole input and see if it has no percent characters, uh, we can just return it. Um, of course, note that while the input is a string view, um, the output is a string. So this still leads to a string construction, um, which has allocation and copy and everything. So um, probably the this optimization is, is slightly less useful than it might seem on the surface because the bulk of uh, the lifting there is gonna be the string construction uh, and copy, not necessarily like iterating over it. Um, but anyway. That's, it's still a fine thing to do, I guess. Okay, so what do we do to percent decode? We create a string builder, and then we make a UTF-8 view over the input, and then we iterate. Um, we iterate with the UTF-8 view iterator, sure. And I guess, oh, here's where the peak um, functions come into play, the ones that we added in a couple of commits ago. So um, let's see, so percent to code. So if we hit a non percent character, we just append it or code point, I should say, not character. I keep messing up on code point versus character. Um, code point, code point. We have lots of code point and we have Lots of code space point. Ugh. Ugh. Code point. Which one is it? Code space point, I feel like. Yeah, it's probably code space point. Isn't the Google Fights still a thing? No, not Google Flights. Google Fights. No, but wait. Google Battle? Google Fight. Uh, that looked like ass. I don't want to use that. Uh, let's just try it. So code point versus code point. <laughs> These websites look uh, really crappy. They don't even work. Cool. Um, does this website still exist? It was this site. Oh my goodness, this is Google Fight. I remembered it being classier somehow. <laughs> uh, code point versus code point. Let's try it. Uh, there we go. Okay, so it's code space point. <coughs> CIA versus FBI. Well, I'm a little bit curious, so let's just check it out. Hmm. Well, um, there we go, I guess. <laughs> so let's get back on track. What were we doing? 
So it's code space point. Uh, that just means that we have a ton of code, <coughs> code uh, no space point in the code base, code no space base, uh, which we should fix. Um, but let's not get sidetracked. So, okay, so if we are we are in percent decode, sure. So we're taking a percent encoded URL string and decoding it into a string. For non-percent non percent code points, just append them. Um, or if the if we peek one step ahead or two steps ahead, uh, and if one of them is not a an ASCII hex digit, then we also uh, append the current code point. So I guess what that means is that if you have um, like if you have something like like this, right? Then this is a percent valid percent encoded um, byte. Whereas if you had something like three x, then this is not valid because x is not a hexadecimal character. And um, then it gets uh, appended verbatim instead. So um, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And then uh, otherwise, we advance the iterator one step, retrieve the uh, hex digit, parse it, uh, shift it left four steps. Sure, 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 sure. Um, that that's probably okay. Mm -hmm. And then append it as a byte to the string builder. I wonder if string is the right container type for percent decoded data. Um, part of me feels like like what you're decoding is like arbitrary bytes and string. Um, while string is like a, a container of bytes, um, it is sort of intended as a um, like a text string container. So it it has things like um, like dot characters, right? Like which gives you a null terminated string. Um, and certainly, if you have a null. If you have a null byte somewhere, which you can encode a, a null byte with URL encoding, um, it would just be, you know, percent zero zero, right? Um, this should not affect the length of the string if you're building it up with a string builder. So you will end up having a string with null bytes in it. But if you call that character saying try to print a string that has null bytes, you will only see up until up until the uh, first null terminator, I guess. So this is something I guess we should question maybe here. So um, are we sure that string is the right output type for um, percent decode? Um, in my mind, string represents a um, text string in some in some text encoding um, not necessarily an arbitrary byte sequence for example um, a percent encoded URL with null bytes in it um, it would be valid but doesn't feel like a string so much um, yeah Let's see, uh, would a byte buffer be a better fit, perhaps? It, it might be that string is the right type, I'm just not sure. Okay, and then the percent and code set enum, sure. And then just the helper functions. 
I mean, uh, the function declarations in the um, header of Earl. Cool. Let's uh, get into the next commit. So replace usages of Earl parser, Earl encode, and Earl decode. This replaces all occurrences of those functions with the newly implemented functions. Uh, Earl percent encode and Earl percent decode. The old functions will be removed in a further commit. So commit message here is out of sync with reality because it says Earl parser here, whereas the there is no Earl parser class. They are in the Earl class. So um, then he's removing Earl parser dot h. Wait, did we miss something here? Earl parser. Where did he add that? Er, Earl parser. Earl parser is a file. Okay. But Earl parser is not a class. So it's just Earl parser dot h has these two functions. So that's a, it's like a little bit of a weird way of expressing that then. Earl parser. Yeah, so this is not a namespace or class. It's just a file called Earl parser dot h. So that tripped me up a little bit, but I guess it's it's not the end of the world. Um, this is more like a, a generic use of colon colon to signify that like, oh, these are within that. All right, fine. Fine. Let's let's ignore that. So what is he doing here? He's just replacing the old Earl encode and early code calls with calls to the new thing, Earl percent decode, percent encode. Sure. Let's see. So here, this looks interesting. It's just um, Earl percent decode string copy buffer. Um, I think we shouldn't need to do a string copy. We probably did a string copy because because why? What is buffer? Um, this, I think there's no need to do a copy of the buffer here. Whatever buffer is, um, we can avoid the string copy here. Um, if we just make a string view over buffer. I know that this didn't, uh, I know you are just uh, placing the um, early code with Earl percent decode here. So not like we have to do it in this commit, just uh, commenting about something I noticed. Yeah, it's also, um, I feel often when I'm doing code review that um, I might have a comment about something, but um, I don't necessarily want the uh, author to take any kind of action on my comment. So um, like it, it does not require a change. So it would be sweet if, if there would be a way to encode that in the comment to saying that like, I don't expect you to change anything in response to this comment. I'm just commenting on something. Uh, and then it wouldn't count towards the, like the unresolved uh, conversations on the PR. Anyway. Um, okay, so just, um, yeah, just more instances of stuff like that. Here, uh, this also feels like another instance of we could be using we could avoid a string allocation here probably because substring um, where is this Earl from user input uh, substring one so substring one will return a string so it's a string construction um, this is another place where I'm noticing uh, we could use substring view instead which would give us a uh, string view without allocating anything Substring view instead of substring and avoid a string. Temporary string. Uh, again, uh, not something we need to change 
Now, just commenting. Hmm. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Sure. All right, fine. This commit seems jolly nice. Okay, remove Earl parser. This removes Earl parser because it's two exposed functions, Earl encode and Earl decode have been superseded by Earl percent encode and Earl percent decode. This is in preparation for the introduction of a new Earl parser. Sweet. Man, this um, this PR is uh, just meticulously um, layered. I, I really like it. Um, add members members variables to the Earl class. Mm -hmm. This adds the m username, m password, m paths, and m cannot be a base URL member variables to the Earl class. These are necessary for the upcoming new Earl parser. The deprecated m path variable shadows the m path variable if it's non null. This behavior will be removed once the old parser has been removed. Yeah, because that felt awkward, so it's good that we can remove it eventually. Um, and um, typo and commit. Since I, I, I wish I could just type the comment up here, but I have to put it somewhere, so. Uh, members variables uh, should be member variables. Okay, so what's going on here? Earl path, if cannot be a base URL, then just return the first entry in the paths vector. Sure, if mpath is non-null, then return mpath. <coughs> mm -hmm. Otherwise, string builder. Um, so we have, um, so it's just adding each path component one at a time separated by slashes. Um, let's see, we have something like that in String Builder, like join, but um, let's see, join. So join takes a separator type and a collection. Right, so I think you could write this as String builder join um, here. <clears throat> builder append. So first we need the initial slash, and then we need the builder join um, slash followed by uh, m paths. I think that would work. I'm not sure if that's nicer, actually. <laughs> that feels kind of convoluted, actually. Like there are instances where it looks nicer, but in this case, Usually, like the reason that join looks nicer in in some places is because um, because you don't want that initial separator. But if you want the separator even before the first item, then join doesn't really add much, right? So I think I think this this uh, is bogus. Yeah, because usually when you're joining something, you have like uh, a vector with like these strings in it and you want to join them up so that it says a comma b comma c, then uh, string builder join is very nice because you just do string builder uh, b b join strings um, with a comma and it takes care of that for you and it doesn't insert a comma before the first one or after the last one. So that's what it does, but since he wants to slash first, yeah, join doesn't really fit. Um, all right, fine, sure. And then, <clears throat> as he mentioned, now you call path to get the the full serialized path. It's fine. Set username, set password. Um, so I think these should take 
the string by value instead of taking it by const reference. But now we're getting into like pointless micro optimization territory. Um, <clears throat> but generally speaking, I uh, when when we are um, when we're taking ownership of a string, like we might as well use um, pass it by value and use move semantics to to uh, minimize the number of copy constructors that run. Okay, and then set port. If port is the default port for scheme, then port is zero. Okay, interesting. I guess that makes sense. So how do we know the default port for scheme? Do we have that somewhere default? Did I miss that somewhere? Wait, where did that come from? Was I not paying attention? Um, let's go backwards. Hmm. Default port for scheme is right there. Oh, of course, of course, because he changed the scheme the word protocol to scheme. Default port for protocol, right. I see. Okay, that makes sense. This is kind of um, kind of an arbitrary place to have a list of protocol numbers, but at the same time, it's probably okay. That's probably okay. So where the heck were we? Um, members variables, right, that's what we were looking at. So just adding the new members and adding accessors for them, sure. Um, here's another instance of like, since we are returning strings that are members of the Earl class, they could return const reference to string instead of doing copy construct, but eh, let's not, let's not obsess about that right now. Okay, and then if we have a port, then I see. So the zero port now means default port for scheme. That makes sense. Okay, so if no port is set, we will just assume that you have the default one. Uh, sure. Um, please omit parameter names um, that are um, already part of the function name. Um, function name, um, parameter, uh, unless disambiguation is needed. Sure. If the port is the default port for the scheme, then port should be zero. Right, so that's what we observed. <laughs> Okay, fine, fine. Um, and then adding some helper functions and private data URL constructor to URL. This adds a few helper functions and a private constructor to instantiate a data URL to the URL class. This, these will be needed by the upcoming URL para ser. Okay, uh, so what's going on here um, is special scheme is special scheme. Hmm. Okay. This feels like it could just as well take a string view instead of a string. Yeah. Seems like 
oftentimes uh, when you have a choice, it if you can avoid forcing your caller to instantiate a string if they don't have one, that's usually nice. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, most notably, um, if you have a caller that has a string, he might already have a hash cached for the string. And if you call something that needs the string hash, if you're using a string object, it will remember the hash, whereas string view does not remember hashes. So they are less optimal in a hash um, scenario. But outside of that, like it's kind of nice to just pass a string view if you don't need um, the cached hash for anything. Okay, includes credentials, means that username is not empty or password is not empty. Sure. Is special is a function of the scheme. Sure. A special scheme is a helper. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and then we're adding this private constructor here that uh, will be used by the new parser. Sure, that's that's fine. So add a new spec compliant URL parser. This adds a new URL parser, which aims to be compliant with the URL specification. It also contains a rudimentary data URL parser. Well, here we go. Friend class URL parser. So this is such a big diff that we cannot see it by default. 666 lines. Well, that's uh, promising. Uh, so let's, I guess, let's look at the header first since we we can do that. So it has a bunch of states. So it's going to be a state machine parser. Um, and let's see. It takes the input as an input it is a string. I immediately feel like that should not be necessary. Because it means that callers are forced to instantiate a string, but Hmm. Let's let's comment on this. It would be nice if callers weren't forced to um, instantiate. Can we make this take um, string view for the input string? So callers aren't forced to uh, provide a string. Also, uh, the base URL has a similar problem that if you want to provide a base URL, you're forced to um, pass a URL by value. And as we've just been looking at the URL class, it's pretty chunky, right? It's like we're adding several string members and heavy stuff to it. So um, URL is pretty heavy for the second argument. Can we pass it? Um, somehow, uh, without copying, uh, either, yeah, as Earl star or, um, um, possibly, uh, with overload. I mean, since it's a, since it has a default. or possibly uh, just having two variants of this API, one with uh, URL const hmm, base URL and one without. Okay. I wonder if these states are from the spec, so special relative Let's see, special relative or authority state. Look at that. So these states here are probably um, yeah, they're like exactly according to spec. So this is um, I have a good feeling about this. Okay, so now we see a bunch of these functions again. We really should find a common place for this type of stuff. 
Okay. So what's going on here? Parse opaque host. Um, forbidden host code points, excluding percent. Mm. Very tasteful. Hmm. Parse opaque host. Returns an optional string. Like, this kind of makes me wonder how much of this parser could be um, const expr. I bet you a whole bunch. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's not obsess about that. Parse IB before address. Um, okay, so there's a fix me about that. Sure, sure. Parse host. So let's let's find the like all of these helpers. I'm sure they're fine. Let's find the main sort of parser um, loop. Okay, Earl parser parse. Great. This parser assumes a UTF-8 encoding. All right. So concept basic URL parser. Let's go to that Earl and see what it says. The basic URL parser takes a string input with an optional null or base URL. Um, sure, and an optional encoding, default UTF-8, so we're not taking an encoding at the moment. Um, and we don't have a way to override the state, so it's not strictly uh, cloning the spec logic, but uh, Still, like, um, it's, it's not always necessary to clone spec logic verbatim, so it's probably fine. So let's see how this thing works. So if it, the input is empty, we return an empty URL. Sure. Should we maybe return an optional URL instead? I don't know. Uh, it is a bit... So I guess Earl has like um, like a valid or invalid state. Um, yeah, it has like a, a valid bit, and maybe it's okay to use that. Part of me feels like if you can avoid encoding validity in objects, it's nice to just not do that, and instead use something like optional. Um, would it be nicer to return optional URL instead and not have to think and um, get rid of the um, URL validity bit entire, entirely? <clears throat> nicer uh, and possible. Yeah, because it is a bit annoying that like you receive an URL and you don't know if it's valid. So like you receive an URL and the first thing you got to do is check, is this valid? It, it's it's akin to receiving a pointer, right? But you have to null check it first. It, there is a lot of, um, there's a subtle cognitive pleasure, I think, in, in receiving an object uh, and you know that it's valid. Uh, right, it's the same thing as where you receive a reference in C++, where you you know that okay, well, I don't need to null check this thing at least. Um, it's just uh, it's something I like. Okay. So if the input string starts with data colon, then we try to parse data URL. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we return an empty URL. Mm -hmm. So parse data URL actually returns an optional it seems like yeah so why not do the same for uh parse um okay then we have some fix me's for like spec compliance things to implement sure and then we start out in the or wait hold, hold on if it contains a tab or new line character then we uh, report a validation error and then replace those with or we just collapse those actually into nothing. Sure. Um, and then we start at in scheme start state. And then here, uh, please 
only declare one variable per line. Uh, please. And um, this is a bit of a strange way to express that, but it's fine. It's creating a string view from a string. Here's a, this <laughs> looks, this is a hint that taking a string view directly might have made sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we instantiate an iterator and then uh, ba -ba 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 -um. substring view as string sure and then comes our big main parser loop continue should only be used to prevent incrementing the iterator as this is done at the end of the loop plus plus iterator is increase pointer by one continue decrease pointer by one uh, and the null code point is used as the EOF code point. All right. And see now our boy Max here is mixing code space point and code no space point, even on the same line. <laughs> it's, it's so hard with stuff like this. Um, but I think it, it's something that we should care about. So, um, Let's say uh, code point, dicta code point. Code point, dicta code point. Yes. Let's care about things like that. Okay, and then we have a classic switch based state machine. Well, and I'm sure that this is fine. Uh, and I'm sure that there are bugs here. I'm not going to audit every uh, branch of this, um, but rather, um, so what, what we're doing here is we're just looking at the structure of, of this uh, parser, because when it comes to stuff like this, like I can sit here and meticulously look through every state and see if it matches the um, the specification, but I think what I prefer to do is to just look at the general structure of something like this, and then uh, we will discover whatever the bugs are through uh, testing and um, continuous use. Uh, and also, also um, when you eventually go and uh, try to implement um, some of the optimizations that we talked about earlier, then that has a tendency to also surface um, any implementation mistakes in your uh, parser because uh, you end up breaking some invariant that wasn't actually invariant in your code. Um, anyway, so this, it looks really tidy. What is buffer? Buffer is... It's a string builder that we're keeping. Okay, so um, we're just appending to it. Does it mention a buffer in the buffer? Let buffer be the empty string. Oh man, that's awesome. Okay, so it it has some kind of spec meaning. That's great. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. So I think the general outline looks fantastic here. Um, oh, drive letter. That's interesting. Drive letter. I guess that's a Windows a Windows drive letter. I didn't realize that those were in the specification. I got a drive letter. 
if the substring from pointer in input does not start with a Windows drive letter. Look at this. A string starts with a Windows drive letter if all of the following are true. Its length greater than or equal to two. First two code points are a Windows drive letter. It's two code points, ASCII alpha and either colon or pipe. That's amazing. I did not, I was not aware that that was specified like that, but it makes sense that they would specify it because it is part of the, part of URLs, right? So what do we have here? Like if input length is two, and is ASCII alpha input zero, and the second character is colon or pipe. Exactly what they said. If it starts with Windows drive letter, these are great. Um, so let's see, if length is less than two, if not ASCII alpha, blah, blah, blah. Um, Yeah, so I'm, I'm just thinking like, like here, oh, you could write this and, and you could have this thing call this other thing with a substring view and blah, 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 and, and do some minuscule code deduplication, but let's not be that way. So very tidy. Um, this does not follow the spec exactly, but rather uses the buffer and only sets the fragment on E off. All right, um, <clears throat> that's probably okay. And then what do we do here at the end? Percent decode all fields that can contain encoded code points. Code space points. <laughs> um, and aren't already decoded by the parser algorithm. The host is already decoded by parse host. Okay, so that's that's like a little bit um, <clears throat> finicky, or, or it's annoying when you have a situation where you have the same data type for something encoded and something decoded, because both of them are string, right? So you don't, you just have to know, like this comment here is how you know that the host has already been decoded it might be nice to have um, discrete types for encoded versus decoded data in this context. Like you could even have a parser local structs or something like that um, just to um, sort of allow the compiler to enforce correct use of these things. Um, so I'm just going to suggest that here, actually. So um, it's unfortunate that both encoded and decoded um, data is string. Perhaps we could fashion some local, uh, two local struct types to um, prevent uh, accidental ambiguous use. Uh, accidental crossover uh, between uh, the two. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how, maybe something like, so something really simple here, just a struct uh, encoded data, string data. Yeah, the, the point point would just be to um, to make it impossible to accidentally cross the streams, uh, if that makes sense. I'm not sure if if that's if that would be doable in an ergonomic way. So, but still, it's it's worth talking about. Okay, so what's going on here? String m data payload. 
this uh, looks out of place. What's going on uh, with um, yeah, that's that's just straight up suspicious. Uh, that looks like a member variable declaration, but it's not used for anything. So definitely some kind of bug. Okay. And at the end here, we set Earl valid to true, right? So in situations where we fail the decode, um, or where we fail the parse, where do we fail the parse? Right, so we have like a validation error gets reported and then you return an empty. So you return an empty URL. So you could just as well return an empty optional URL because you don't actually uh, mark the URL as valid until the very end. So I think, right? So like right before we exit, we say, oh, that's a valid URL. So I, I think it could return optional URL. Um, yeah. Since we only uh, set the URL to valid at the end, it does seem to me that this function could return optional URL instead. Yes. So that's that's cool. Wait, um, report validation error. So you have situations where you have a validation error, but a validation error is just a debug print. It doesn't mean that we necessarily fail to parse. Um, it just means that we complain on the debug console. <laughs> um, let's see, does, does the spec say like, oh, report a validation error, report? Validation error. A validation error indicates a mismatch between input and valid input. User agents, especially conformance trackers, are encouraged to report them somewhere. Right. Note, a validation error does not mean that the parser terminates. Termination of a parser is always stated explicitly, e.g. through a return statement. Right. Yeah, okay, so that, that makes perfect sense. Well done. Okay. I think we're good there. So let's just um, keep going. Add spec compliant URL serialization methods. This adds URL serialization methods, which are more in line with the specification. <clears throat> the serialize for display method should be used, e.g. in the browser address bar, and as per the spec, should not display username and password. <clears throat> Furthermore, it could decode most percent encoded code points although that is not implemented yet. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's be that guy once again. A typo in commit message, <clears throat> code points, code points. <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me. Hmm. All right, so, hmm. So we're serializing a data URL uh, here, and it does some verification, sure. And then we create a string builder. Um, this all looks super tidy. And the data payload is presumably URL encoded at this point. I guess it has to be if you're serializing. Um, is it percent encoded? Is payload percent encoded? I forget. M data payload. Where is the data payload? That was like that stray declaration at the very end. M data payload. This looks out of place, right? And it's not assigned. Um, but there was a parse data URL. 
So, oh, I guess it, this will invoke that um, constructor that we added in the previous commit. The data URL constructor, okay, so it takes the payload is the second argument here. Okay, sure, M data payload, it's a string. And then let's see what he did with that in uh, parse data URL. So that's the body argument here. Earl, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, body, 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 body. Where's the body? Here. Percent decode encoded body. Hmm. <clears throat> so it's it's decoded data. Serialized data URL. It feels this is decoded. <clears throat> I feel like it should be encoded. This um, not be encoded. If uh, if I understand correctly, M data payload is decoded. Um, contains decoded data. Um, percent encoded. Okay, let's actually see what the spec says about that. So, serialized data. Um, <coughs> oh, why is my voice doing this? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so let's go here. Mm, I don't see anything mentioned about data. If host is no no. Hmm. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll, I'm just gonna leave that question in there. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Um. Sure. Okay. So let's let's just follow this thing. So um, add the scheme. Add the colon. If you have a non-null host, add slash slash. And then if you have credentials, you put the percent encoded username first, and then the optionally a percent encoded password if present after um, a colon. Sure. I guess that's fine. Um, and then you add a host after an at character. Hmm. Does that make sense? Let's see. If it has credentials, you add the username, um, colon, password, and then at, and then host serialized. Okay. All right. Fine. 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 Okay, right, yeah, and then if host, the, if the port is non-zero, which means that it's not the default port, if it's the default port for the scheme, we don't need to put the port. Fine. Um, all right, fix me, temporary empath hack, sure. Yep, yep, yep. So we still have empath versus path, um, but I guess that goes away eventually. And um, yeah, this all looks fine. You got the fragment encoding at the end. <clears throat> as long as you shouldn't exclude the fragment. Sure. Serialize for display. I was not aware. <clears throat> I was not aware of serialize for display. <clears throat> URL rendering. 
It should be rendered in its serialized form with modifications described below when the primary purpose of displaying a URL is to have the user make a security or trust decision. Um, that's interesting. So it just basically, you don't show the password, I guess, when you render a URL. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So let's just, um, I feel like that's probably fine. Serialize for display. Very good. Um, I actually do have one note here. I feel like this bool argument is very arbitrary. Um, and I think if you call like Earl serialize true, Earl serialize false, uh, you, it doesn't, it, it's not at all obvious what that argument means. Um, it's not at all obvious what this bool boolean argument parameter does. Um, let's serialize uh, true. Uh, yeah, like uh, can uh, we? Add an enum for can we use a, an enum for it instead? Something like something like um, enum class exclude fragment um, no yes something like that because then. Um, Then we go from uh, Earl serialize true to Earl serialize exclude fragment. Yes. Which is uh, a lot more understandable. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of this type of thing. Um, just because it helps make call sites so much more understandable. So let's do that. Okay. Replace old URL parser with the new URL parser parse. This replaces the old URL parse and URL complete URL parsing mechanisms with the new spec compliant URL parser parse. And here the helpers go away and my my dear old ad hoc Earl parser goes away as well. Well, so long, dude. That's fine. Very happy to see this. Um, very happy to see it go away. That's super cool. Uh, remove usage of Earl set path. Um, right. Okay. So this is just somebody using the set path. API and they now have to call set paths instead. That's fine, I guess. Um, so I would just suggest here to simplify this further because if you're just creating a string from a number, since you're now just creating a string from a number, <clears throat> Please use string colon colon number. Get pid. Yes, that's fine. And then remove usage of Earl set path. Hmm. I feel like we should be removing the initial slash there. Should we not remove the uh, leading? slash character here. Mm -hmm. Replace Earl two string with new serialized implementation. Oh, my dear serializer. <laughs> I'm so glad that this crappy old code gets such a nice, huge upgrade. It's so cool. Hmm. Earl equals 
does a serialize on both Earls to compare. I mean, yeah, you kind of have to do that, but um, it does it does uh, tell you that like um, using an Earl as a hash key, for example, um, it's probably going to be pretty heavy because in order to compare to Earls, you have to serialize both of them. Uh, two string and two string encoded both return serialize. All right, fine. That's fine. Wait, what was the second argument to to equals equals exclude fragments? Okay, so um, there's another good place to use the exclude fragment in them we made earlier. Okay, uh, that's just remove a deprecated empath member variable from Earl. The empath member variable has been superseded by empaths, thus it has been removed. The path getter will continue to exist as a convenience met method for getting the path joined together as a single a string. Great. That's cool. All right, so the just the path member disappears. Now we only have a vector of path components. Rewrite Earl compute validity to conform to new parser. Okay, this rewrites the Earl validation check to be more specific so it can more accurately detect if a user of, of Earl class constructs invalid URLs by hand. Typo in commit message of 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 of. of. Um, this relies on some assumptions about how the spec defined Earl parser works that may turn out to be wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Um, obviously, like, when you first implement a spec, you don't understand the spec fully. Uh, and even by the time you're finished implementing it, there's, oh, usually a pretty high chance that you misunderstood something. And so that misunderstanding has now been encoded in your implementation, and then It'll take some time to discover what those misunderstandings may have been. Um, but that's all just part of the game. It's, it's all good. So compute validity. Um, compute validity. But who calls this, though? Because like the parser was setting the validity at the end. So is this the very last commit? No, it's not. Um, I'm going to have to fetch this code. So git fetch max whip flee. Um, and let's just look at his code. So Earl parser. Um, let's see. Compute validity. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, I see, I see. Right. So when you are assigning to something, you're assigned to like an individual part of the URL, then we have to recompute whether it's valid or not. Right. So this is kind of, um, kind of orthogonal or whatever to the parser in that, um, we have to check if you're making like a little spot change to the URL, does the URL still make sense? This kind of makes me wonder a little bit if, um, if it makes sense to have setters for like individual, um, Earl parts, um, like set scheme, for example, or if you could implement set scheme, uh, in terms of like, um, serializing and, and reparsing the URL with the scheme substituted. Um, that would be a bit weird, but it would allow you to reuse the parser to recheck validity. Um, I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm just going to make a note about that. Uh, I wonder if this could be implemented in terms of, um, serializing and D and reparsing. Um, 
serializing a modified version of the URL and reparsing it that uh, if that could avoid well that would um, make sure we always use the exact same logic as the parser to validate changes it may be impractical though I'm not sure how it would be done yeah right so yeah this is probably missing um, checks but it, it looks like a decent effort to, to validate some of the changes um, I think it would be nice to to have a little conversation about like how to move forward with that but at the same time it's definitely not a blocker like uh, because um, this is I think the the Earl spec does not um, it doesn't talk about like what do you do if you have created an Earl object and then somebody calls set scheme to set a different scheme uh, because they're just talking about like how what what the how does an Earl work how do you parse it how do you serialize it it doesn't say like well what if you have an API where you change some little part of it how does the whole Earl react to that um, and it makes sense that they don't specify that at least I don't think they do because that would be weird weird thing to um, specify of course if this had been a um, like a, a web JavaScript type that you could interact with from JavaScript, then they would specify that. But anyway, uh, this adds more tests for ACK Earl. Furthermore, this also changes some tests to conform to what the reworked Earl class does and the Earl specification mostly expects. Cool. Right. So then just um, updating various tests, protocol becomes scheme. So That's fine. I was just thinking like, did we break the build earlier? But but he did say that he was keeping the old uh, protocol name in there uh, for compatibility, which makes sense then that it wouldn't have broken already. Um, and just amending with a bunch of tests. This is very nice. Um, file Earl without host name. Yeah, so I mean, there are a lot of like behavioral changes. I think this test was probably broken earlier, but it's fine to change, to update the test and correct everything. Cause I don't expect people to, um, like if, you, if you're breaking tests in one commit, but you're fixing the test in the subsequent commit, I think that's, that's okay. Uh, if they're part of the same PR, because it just helps um, things feel sort of atomic but or actually maybe that's maybe that's incorrect maybe it would feel more atomic if you did not only did you not break the build but you also did not break any tests so yeah uh, the the completely meticulous perfect way of approaching this would be if you change the behavior of a test you would update the test in the same commit yeah that, that would be the more more atomic thing but i think it's okay here that uh, the test is fixed in a separate commit because there's just this um, adding of a bunch of cases and expansion of the test's coverage. So yeah, it's 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 fine. <clears throat> Percent encode um, and decode request URI in libhttp. Okay. So this percent encodes decodes the request URI when creating or parsing raw HTTP requests. This is necessary because ACK Earl now contains percent decoded data, meaning we have to re-encode it for creating raw requests. Um, it feels so weird that, or no, no, it's it's good that um, ACK Earl has percent decoded data. That's what I expect. Right, right. No, okay. I, I was getting off on the wrong track here. This is not weird. This makes sense. It makes sense that you have to encode if you have a, a, a URL object and you want to 
serialize it into an HTTP request, it makes sense to me that at that point you have to um, make sure that you're en encoding. Um, right. Yeah, that seemed fine. Add hostname parameter to URL create with file scheme. This adds a hostname parameter as the third parameter to URL create with file scheme. If the hostname is localhost, it will be ignored as per the URL specification. Well, I did not know that. Um, or maybe I did know that, I just forgot. <laughs> I'm not sure what the difference is. Okay, so file scheme URLs can have a host name, <clears throat> but localhost is just collapsed into nothing. That's fine. A file URL always needs a non null host name. Okay. Fine with me. And then <clears throat> in various places, we use proper APIs for creating file URLs replaces ad hoc generation of file URL strings with using URL create with file scheme. That's really nice. Look at that. So we used to construct URLs using a string builder and some tape and glue. And now we use create with file scheme. Very cool. Very, very cool. That is just sweet. Okay. Um, fine. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just good stuff. It makes me think about um, if we should use like serialize for display somewhere. Um, but uh, it, I guess it doesn't matter for file URLs because file URLs don't have credentials. Uh, oh, that's the end of it. Okay, so we got to the end. Cool. So this was really awesome. I, I really love this PR and uh, we should write something um, here. So, but there were a bunch of things that needed fixing. Um, and we did find some bugs, so it's definitely uh, request changes here, and uh, this is super awesome. Thank you for working on this. Um, yes, let's send it. Okay, so I think that um, will be the end of the review video. So if you made it this far, then I thank you for watching and for hanging out. Um, I'm still still figuring out how to make these code review videos, but I think uh, it's, it's really fun to just sit down and, um, and engage with code review in this sort of slow and verbalizing way. Uh, at least I'm certainly enjoying it because usually, normally when I do this, I don't talk out loud, obviously. So doing that, it, it gives it a different pacing and it is very enjoyable. So thank you for um, indulging me, I guess. Uh, anyway, I hope that it was interesting. So I'll see you all next time. Bye.